Good afternoon, uh, everyone. So this event uh, features uh, two distinguished uh, guests, uh, General H.R. McMaster and also uh, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, the eighth uh, Secretary General of the United Nations. So we are very happy to uh, host uh, this event. And so thanks for coming uh, to join us. So over the last uh, <coughs> two decades, uh, Mr. Ban has become a close collaborator with the Korea program and also a very uh, close personal friend. Uh, I know uh, him for almost now 20 years. So during his time as, as a UN Secretary General, uh, he came to our program uh, twice. Uh, I still remember uh, in a big uh, in an audience uh, with his visit. And then he came uh, one more time after he left the UN uh, on the invitation from our student group. So at least uh, during my time here, uh, this is our fourth visit uh, by Mr. Ban <coughs> to uh, our campus, and I'm really honored to uh, welcome you back to our campus. So this uh, visit uh, also marks the start of a new uh, impact uh, partnership uh, between uh, our center and the Ban Ki-moon Foundation uh, for a better future. So I'm very happy to share uh, this big news. So together we are launching uh, what we call Stanford uh, Trans-Pacific Dialogue, an annual dialogue in Asia to make uh, much needed progress on today's most pressing uh, sustainable development challenges. So the dialogue will spur new research and practice partnership uh, between uh, experts and leaders uh, in the United States and Asia. So critically, <clears throat> the dialogue will engage uh, local communities and empower uh, youth to become leaders for sustainable development uh, in the Asia Pacific region. So as you know, uh, climate change is the defining issue of this century. So we could not uh, have found a better partner than Mr. Barnes Foundation to focus our work on sustainability and climate change action. Under his leadership, uh, United Nations established the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and its underlying uh, Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. So together with Mr. Barnes Foundation, we will spur new research and practice partnership to make progress on these critical global challenges, uh, these, global, these goals address, among them climate change, uh, poverty, and inequality. So we've been working on this exciting new project uh, for a month, and we are going to make uh, a more uh, announcement uh, with the details uh, in the coming months. So please visit our website uh, for more details. Okay, now I, I'll now turn to uh, General McMaster to formally introduce uh, Mr. Ban Ki-moon and his career as a public servant and international uh, leader. Okay, General McMaster, not yet. <laughs> Okay, General McMaster is a Ford and Michelle Azami Senior Fellow at Hoover Institution here. He's also Bernard and Suja uh, Liutal Fellow at uh, FSI uh, in this building, also teaching at uh, Graduate School of Business. So he was the 26th Assistant to the President uh, for National Security Affairs. So now let's welcome uh, H.R. McMaster. <laughs> Hey, it's just another great day at Stanford, isn't it? You know, it's a beautiful day. I get to be in a room with two of my heroes, Secretary Perry and Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Uh, and I think all of us are extremely fortunate today because we get to, to welcome someone to campus uh, who is, who is a, a, a peacemaker and a humanitarian uh, at a time when we are witnesses to war and, and brutality. So. 
Uh, thank you for being with us, Secretary General. I'd like to share a few thoughts about the Secretary General, uh, and, and I know all of you already know how fortunate we are to be in his presence and to welcome him here. But first of all, I'm indebted to, to Professor Giwok Sheen and the, and the, and the uh, Korea Center for the Great Honor of introducing a man uh, for whom I have the deepest admiration. Mr. Ban Ki-moon is a distinguished statesman and a humanitarian, as I mentioned. It's impossible to, to, to imagine, I think, a more fitting uh, keynote speaker for the Korea Center's anniversary conference. Mr. Bond will be 78 next month. <laughs> Congratulations and a happy early birthday to you, sir. Um, so uh, 78 years is a lot of experience, uh, but as you know, experience doesn't always develop wisdom. Uh, Mr. Ban Ki-moon is a wise person. He understands the horror of war and why we must do all we can to prevent it. When he was six years old, he fled to a remote mountainside region in South Korea to escape the violence of the, of the Korean War. He then became determined from that point on to make a positive difference in this world. As a high school student in 1962, he won an essay contest sponsored by the Red Cross, which brought him to San Francisco to live with a host family for several months. During that time, he met President John F. Kennedy, after which he decided to become a diplomat. For many in this audience today, he is best known for his service as the eighth Secretary General of the United Nations from January 2007 to December 2016. He lasted a lot longer in that job than I did in mine in Washington. <laughs> his, his, uh, his, his new book, Resolved, Uniting Nations in a Divided World, recounts his experiences and tenure as UN Secretary General. In it, he describes his unrelenting, noble efforts to institute reform and to foster international cooperation on vital issues, including global warming, sustainable development, and gender equality. But before serving as the UN Secretary General, Mr. Bond already had an extraordinary three-decade-long career as a diplomat. He served as South Korea's 31st Minister of Foreign Affairs and, and Trade, and he also served as National Security Advisor to the President. His many overseas postings included the United States, India, and Central Europe. And you might say that he's in the midst now of, of, a, of, a third, uh, of a third career as he continues to help build a better world for generations to come as the founder and chair of the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens, the chair of the International Olympic Committee's Ethics Commission, president of the Global Green Growth Institute, and the chair of the Global Center on Adaptation. And Secretary General Bond is the ideal person to help us celebrate the anniversary of this great center because he is also an educator, an alumnus of Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. None of us here will hold that against you. Secretary General Bond holds an endowed chair at Seoul Uni uh, National University's Department of Political Science and International Relations, which is his alma mater. Please join me in welcoming statesman, humanitarian, and educator Ban Ki-moon to Stanford University the Freeman Spogel Institute, and the Korea Center. Welcome, sir. Great to see you. I'll give you a hand up there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, General McMaster, for your very kind introduction. I think uh, I'm very much honored by such a great uh, introduction. I have been introduced by many people many times, but this is by far one of the most honorable you know, <laughs> remarks about my, my uh, contribution to the world. I thank you very much. And I'm also very much honored by the presence of um, Dr. Bill Perry, former Secretary of Defense, who has made a great contribution to peace and security of the Korean Peninsula through his well-known Perry process. We really wished that your Perry process had worked out successfully. Otherwise, um, we would not be still suffering from all this um, South and North con confrontational relationship and the security concerns 
caused by uh, North Korea. And I'm also uh, among many distinguished participants. I would like to recognize the presence of uh, Honorable Kim Hyung Oh, who was Speaker of the Korean National Assembly, and thank you for your participation, and also um, participation of um, Honorable Yun Sang Soo, the Consul General of the Republic of Korea in uh, San Francisco, and also uh, Dr. Sigrid Hecker, who is also w very well known to Korean people. Again, uh, thank you for your contribution. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear, dear faculty members, and the participants and many students, many students. It's a great honor and for me to be here for second time after my retirement from the United Nations. I was here and met the General McMaster and many others. I think it was uh, April 2019. Since then, because of this lockdown caused by COVID-19, I had to uh, stay at home and I am very pleased to be here on the occasion of a 20th anniversary of this Asia Pacific Research Center. And I'd like to really thank and highly commend the continuing efforts and contribution of Professor Shin gi -uk, who has been really uh, trying to connect between Korea and the United States, uh, between and Korea also Stanford University and I, I wish you a continuing uh, good success. Again, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor uh, to uh, speak with you today at Stanford University here in the heart of Silicon Valley. Today, we stand on the precipice of a period of great change, one that will have a profound implications for the Korean Peninsula, our planet, and the future of humanity. My deep appreciation goes again to uh, Professor Shin gi Director of the Korea Program at Stanford, Walt H. Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center for extending an invitation for me today. At the same time, I extend my warmest congratulations to the Korea Program at Stanford on the occasion of 20th anniversary. I hope another 20 or 30 years you will contribute to make uh, sure that Koreans and Americans and Koreans and global citizens around the world will really contribute to make this world much better. As a former Secretary General, now what I'm doing, as we had been very eloquently introduced by General McMaster, I'm doing as a private citizen to make sure that all humanity and our planet can live together sustainably for our better future. This is, I think, my moral responsibility. Not, I do not have any political or legal responsibility at this time, but I still think that I have moral responsibility to make sure that our succeeding generations and our planet Earth and our humanity can live sustainable way. That's my uh, strong commitment. Ladies and gentlemen, again, um, at the moment in history when the co co ongoing COVID-19 pandemic continues to append our economies and societies, regional conflicts and great power tensions are continuing including the one which we, we see, the unacceptable aggression of Russia, of aggression of uh, Ukraine by uh, Russia, nuclear power state, and one of the superpowers, again. And in addition to this, we have uh, many, many, many crises, many uh, serious issues, climate change, and there has been a more pro pronounced uh, contrast between diverging path of the two Koreas still in our rapidly changing world. Like uh, this relationship between... Wow, that's a <laughs> big welcome.
This is a big welcome sign again. <laughs> Thank you very much again. Now, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, something about our relationship uh, between South and North Korea. In our rapidly changing world, it's like uh, some story of a tale of two cities, tale of two cities. Indeed, one part of Korea in the South is a responsible member of a global community of cultural production, taste-making power, and the leader in science and technology and innovation. But the other part of Korea in the North is seen as a global paria, a country with stunned de development and hunger, a systemic abuse of human rights, and the nuclear armed threat to peace and security on the Korean Peninsula and beyond. This dichotomy hasn't occurred in a vacuum. So let me briefly talk about how we got here and some possible ways forward. Since national division in 1945 and the subsequent very tragic war between the South and North, which was caused by North Koreans in 1950 until 1953, the world has been dramatically witnessing a vividly co contrasting scene in relations to what is transpiring in the two Koreas. In the case of the Republic of Korea, the world has seen it as an exemplary case of successful national transformation. By any standard, Korea is now one of the 10th largest economy when it comes to per capita income. According to all these recent statistics, Korea can be one of the G7, in fact, surpassing that of Italy. Uh, but Korean president has been open, been invited to, to by the G7 leaders. But I think uh, in reality, Korea can claim that we are G7. But at the same time, what I have been claiming and suggesting to our Korean government is that we should be ready to do much more than what these statistics are, are telling us. Uh, what I am very sorry about what with my country is that we should do much, much more in terms of providing official development assistance to many developing countries. Now, it has been also powered through the hard work and sacrificial, uh, sacrificial devotion of the people, as well as a guiding commitment to education. I think this uh, quality education has made the Korean people outstanding in world community. As I said, international assistance was also instrumental in nurturing our development. Incredibly, South Korea has succeeded in trans transitioning from a recipient to a global donor country within the span of just two generations. Whether you believe it or not, by any standard or statistics, Korea is the only country in the world who has become a donor country from a recipient country. You may think that there may, there may be another examples, but I cannot believe myself. Korea is the only country who used to be receiving assistance from develop, developed countries, and now we have become the develop, developed and donor-given donor country. We are very much proud of this. Uh, this is mostly visible today through the global success of Korean popular music, drama, movies, food, and many others. And such achievements and successes have drast drastically boosted Korea's soft power on the world stage. Generally speaking, the hard power 
of a country consists of military and economic capacity alongside sort of some political coercion. On the other hand, soft power relates to various methods of communication and connection among different peoples which are less political, less human, humane, and inclusive. Soft power does not center on coercion. Rather, it is recognized by the ability to attract the preferences of others via non-coercive constructive means. With this in mind, those who are exposed to and connect, connect with the soft power of another country tend to have a more favorable reception, particularly compared with more traditional hard power that is advanced through military and economic capacities. At the same time, countries underpinned with the soft power respect and implement global rules and norms. In today's era of pandemics, conflict uncertainty, climate crisis, and other transnational challenges, I am of the view that soft power is now more important than ever. Indeed, soft power reinforces and enhances constructive cooperation and partnership, both bilaterally and multilaterally. Soft power does not seek hegemony. It is leadership that works side by side with others. And in our increasingly interconnected and globalized world, soft power is projected everywhere and is primarily manifested by cultural flows and people-to-people -people exchanges. This can occur through the arts, including music, film, TV, literature, and dance, as well as through sports and even food. It can also occur through travel and tourism. And today, technology and migration can disseminate cultural output faster and in more organic ways through people-to-people -people exchanges than ever before. Under this backdrop, the Republic of Korea is enjoying considerable soft power on the global stage today. While our military and political hard power may not project immense strength in comparison to other great powers such as the United States, China, but Korean soft power assets, however, are incredibly well known and increasingly popular around the world. I understand that uh, Mr. Lee Suman, the manager of this K-pop uh, BTS, uh, will have an opportunity of addressing all this issue. This drives taste, nurtures appreciation, and invites collaboration and exchange across both borders and seas. This includes, as I said, K-pop music such as BTS and others, Korean food like kimchi and bibimbap, Korean TV and cinema, such as Netflix mega hit Squid Game and the Oscar-winning best picture film Parasite, Korean sport including football star Son Hong, Son Hong Min, and figure skater Yuna Kim, K-beauty products, Korean technology, and even Korean personal protective equipment like K-94 masks. Uh, but no, almost nobody is wearing them. There are some, <laughs> but I understand that uh, in San Francisco it is free uh, not to wear masks again. In any way, this so-called so Hallyu, the Korean wave, has captivated foreign publics the world over and shows 
no signs of abating. And as a result, other nations are attempting to replicate Korea's success as a smart, middle-powered country with a super, superpower cultural cash. Consider BTS, for example, which may be the most popular and famous band today. BTS instantly sells out sta stadiums around the globe, has boosted the popularity of Korean language studies in faraway countries such as Colombia and Nigeria in many other uh, Eastern European countries. And it has led to an entirely new generation of fans wanting to travel to Korea to explore Korean culture on a deeper level. You may find me quite strange today talking about, not about security issues, but talking about all these issues. But this is a reality of what the Korean people are very much of, uh, proud of. Again, this represents a true sea change from foreign populations viewing Korea primarily through the prism of the North Korean nuclear issue or conflict and division. Now I'm talking about a little bit about security now. And this exemplifies what Professor Joseph Nye meant when he first coined the term soft power in the early, late 1980s. Defines it as, I quote, the ability to shape the pref preference of others through appeal and attraction, the currency of soft power, the culture, political values, and foreign politics. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, in stark contrast, what is happening now talking about uh, North Korea? North Korea is rather dark, exceedingly negative, and ultimately tragic. North Korea and its leadership are almost singularly focused on the development of the weapons of mass destruction, WMD program. This takes the form of increasingly brazen ballistic missile tests, nuclear tests, and other various provocations that jeopardize peace and security, not only on the Korean Peninsula, but regionally and globally as well. And North Korea has carried out such provocations, including 16 missile tests in 2022 alone, this year alone, in flagrant viol violations of numerous United Nations Security Council resolutions, as well as the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of the Nuclear Weapons, NPT regime. At the same time, the North Korean regime does not care about the long-suffering North Koreans' well-being and basic human rights or their country's inhibited social economic development. Indeed, instead, they accumulate horrendous arms and power their limited national resources into the development of such dangerous military technologies. And this is all the, all the more appalling, considering North Korea's long history of food insecurity and malnutrition, which disproportionately impacts the most vulnerable groups, including children and elderly people. Indeed, in his March 2022 report submitted to the Human, Human Rights Council of the United Nations, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in the DPRK, Mr. Oheya Quintana, wrote that there are, I quote, serious concerns that segments of the population, especially vulnerable populations, may be facing hunger and starvation, unquote. 
I take this opportunity to convey my deepest concerns over last week's report that Pyongyang is currently battling on, on Omicron outbreak and has instituted a further tightened lockdown. Considering that North Korea's leadership has uh, turned down vaccines offered by the Republic of Korea, as well as international community, and remains one of the only two countries in the world who have not undertaken a COVID-19 vaccination campaign. This serious outbreak has the potential to cause vast suffering. Do you know which one other country which has not ever vaccinated their own people in addition to North Korea? That's Eritrea, Eritrea. That's a very small and African country. I commend the President Yun Song Yeol, newly installed on his offer of immediate and unconditional humanitarian support, including emergency assistance to combat COVID-19. And I urge the North Korean leadership to take into serious consideration the human toll the Omicron virus has wreaked on, their vac on other vaccinated Asian cities, including Shanghai, Hong Kong, and Seoul. On a personal note, North Korea's singular pursuit of hard power has cast a dark shadow across my life and career. I grew up, as you are very well aware, during a time when the embers still burned from the Korean War. As a child of war, I saw the total destruction it caused firsthand and felt the stunted development it wrought on the divided peninsula. As a Korean foreign minister and the Secretary General of the United Nations, I have worked tirelessly in pursuit of denuclearization, human rights, peace and security on the Korean Peninsula throughout my long career of almost, 40, almost 50 years, in fact, including my 10 years of service at the United Nations. In the early 1990s, I served as a vice chairman of the South-North Joint Nuclear Control Commission, known as the JNCC, and took part in negotiations with North Korean representatives leading up to the agreement and joint declaration on the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula of 1991. I'm still very proud that I was one of the first negotiators. I was one of the five negotiators which led to this very famous joint declaration of the nuclear denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. As a foreign minister, I led sustained diplomatic efforts during the process of adopting joint statement during the fourth round of the six-party talks in 2005. And as UN Secretary General, I emphasized on a number of occasions the importance of focusing on North Korean issues, including denuclearization and human rights. As the Secretary General, I also pursued opportunities to visit the country, North Korea, on three occasions, all the times without any reasons, North Korean government has canceled without any explanations. So it's been over 30 years since the last Secretary General has paid a visit to North Korea during the time of uh, uh, that's my predecessor, predecessor, Egyptian uh, Secretary General. Yeah. As a Secretary General, I also um, really tried, I tried my best efforts to diffuse all this tension between South and North Korea, but 
all this, my effort as Secretary General has been blocked by North Koreans. As a result of this deep personal and professional focus on North Korean issues, and in spite of many challenges and frustrations I faced, I have never stopped believing that sustainable peace and denuclearization is eventually possible. But at the same time, we must recall the wisdom of the maxim that says, hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. Ladies and gentlemen, dear students and faculty, today, North Korea is a country which solely possesses hard power, while at the same time, it suffocates the creativity, innovation, and culture of its own people through systemic repression, state control, and censorship. The Republic of Korea, meanwhile, is a global soft power, pace setter, but also is prepared to wield hard power when necessary. In this regard, I believe it is rather apt to compare North Korea to a heavy cast iron, which seems very strong and robust, but could in fact be broken as a result of even a small fracture inside. This may be the case when North Korea is now facing. Conversely, I believe the Republic of Korea is more like a stem of bamboo, the inner part of which is decidedly hollow, but offers significantly more resilience, flexibility against both internal and external shocks. A hard power and soft power are not the only two paths. What then should the most desirable future for a country in today's world of increasing uncertainty and inherently global challenges be? I'm of the view that it is most adventurous to fuse a unique combination of both hard and soft power into a forward-thinking national identity of smart power. And one of the important strategies for a country to be a smart power is to combine and ultimately transcend hard power and soft power-related attributes and characteristics. To do so, I believe a truly advanced country should strive to amalgamate military preparedness, economic strength, cultural prowess, technological innovation, multilateral leadership, environmental protection, elevated official development assistance, and global citizens. And here lies the guiding importance of global citizens, global citizenship. Global citizens possess compassion towards and take care of others. They are not selfish, but demonstrate respect for other humans and planet. They collaborate and innovate across borders. They build bridges rather than erect walls. They work for a better world, one where our collective future is a peaceful, sustainable, inclusive, and prosperous. As such, I have been encouraging global citizenship as a driving vision for all. Ultimately, the bright future of Korea, one dynamic enough to assume greater leadership in an uncertain and multiple polar, a multi multipolar world, should be to ensure that it further advances into a smart power country. And the best way to achieve this is to educate our future generations to help them live in both harmony and peace with the other human beings, irrespective of their nationality. And I'm confident 
that insights shared at the Stanford University Korea Program 20th Anniversary Conference can help fulfill this vision and further fortify the alliance. Indeed, the U.S. and ROC alliance is not limited to the military or, the, or hard power spheres. Rather, our people-to-people, -people, economic, academic, and cross-cultural connections have been integral in the success of our enduring uh, relationship. In an uncertain future, I'm certain that Korea's ascension into a smart power can advance a common destiny for all, one rooted in peace, sustainability, and prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen, I conclude my remarks by wishing Stanford University continued success and prosperity in the future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please take a seat. the microphone and then uh, take only two. So once again, say who you are, then uh, ask a question, not a lecture, okay? <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Kelly. I'm a junior studying international relations and doing a master's degree in communication. I wanted to ask you, for college students and students who are currently still at school and not able to engage full-time in activism, what do you think is the best way we can contribute to your vision of a sustainable and prosper, uh, prosperous um, balance between North and South Korea and also international relations in general? Uh, I think uh, your question should not limit to South Korea, or, but I'd like to say in general, uh, since you are young, student aspiring to become a global citizen, what, as a former Secretary General, and while working as a Secretary General, I have been really emphasizing the importance of people, particularly leaders, to have empathy, of course, passion, but at the same time, compassion. This is what I have been uh, trying to uh, empower young people as a future global leaders. And then you have to have uh, global citizens. When I was a young, young boy, uh, 18 years old, I was really uh, inspired by President John F. Kennedy. In 1962, when the Cold War was at the height of this and people were not speaking each other, but at that time, Strangely enough, President Kennedy told us to a group of young people, well, the politicians are not talking each other, but you young people can do much better. The national boundaries do not mean much. There are no boundaries. There were boundaries, much, much heightened and strong boundaries. But he said that the question was whether you are ready to extend your helping hand. What does that mean by helping hand? Helping hand me meant some compassion and support and humanity. That really you know, inspired me. At that time, even though I was very young, without knowing any, anything about international politics, I thought somehow I should become a diplomat. Just make sure that my country would do better. I never thought about uh, being Secretary General at that time. If I say so, that was a lie. That would be a lie. You know. <laughs> in any way, as I grew up, uh, later I thought about the, what could I do for the global peace and global security. That was my uh, vision. Now, just asking to your question, I think, first of all, it is uh, very important that young people should have a good quality education. 
But education should not limit it to just delivering the knowledge. You can get all this knowledge from all different sources. It's very easy. You may not need even support from professors. You can check all these uh, Googles, etc. <laughs> How to get quality education means that young people, while you should be very ambitious, but you should be uh, uh, combining your quality uh, as, um, I think, uh, with a passion and compassion. But normally young people would have only passion Unlimited passion. You want to do everything. <laughs> but if you are not, your, if your passion is not matched and balanced with compassion, empathy for others, then you may not be able to know where you are going. So that is my message to you, that try to be a global citizen. Then why I'm talking about global citizen? It's a very hard to find the global leaders in this world. I have met almost all the leaders around the world, except North Korean leader. <laughs> <laughs> then I have seen very few leaders who were truly a global leaders with a global citizen, minding and caring for all the problems around the world. At best, most of the leaders, they are national leaders. What we need at this time is not national leaders. We need global leaders. I think you can, you can become global leaders through good quality education at Stanford. Thank you very much. Um, hello, I'm Son Nayoung, and I'm from Gyeonggi-do, Namyeongju, South Korea. Um, and my question might be a bit disappointing because um, I'm a student and as a Korean citizen who grew up in Korea, I always have this conflict in between, oh, do I express my egokshim like in terms of by shining the name, you know, Korea and like participating as a global citizens to the global world um, and trying, you know, and like be, be like express my egokshim or do I focus on like the issues within Korea and like try to um, address those issues first before I become like a global citizen and act on the global stage? And what was your personal experience of like going through this conflict? And what would be your message to um, the younger generations from Korea like um, facing this conflict? Now you just say in Korean egokshim, yeah, there's a patriotism. I think you should have patriotism. I think everybody, Americans may have, uh, you know, they have a patriotism for Americans. Again, I think your question is almost uh, similar to the previous questions. Now, at this time, again, um, dear young uh, students, I think you should have uh, global vision, global vision. Uh, just look beyond this uh, uh, United States, beyond the Stanford beyond Stanford, uh, that will be very important. And then there may be, in addition to what uh, you may do uh, in outside of the curriculums, curriculum activities, uh, you may think about what you can do for others. Uh, just try to visit some African countries. You will really be humbled by what you will see. I have been, you know, while I really try to uh, maintain my, uh, uh, you know, uh, the position, you know, always uh, quiet, but my heart was uh, aching, you know, uh, hearts are broken all times uh, by what I have seen. But I had a limited, Secretary General didn't have much uh, superpower. Without support from the United States, particularly, the UN could not uh, function properly without financial and political support and European Union support, etc. So what is, is almost, uh, you know, is apt for you, is apt to be having some limited vision, limited, you are limited to see what's happening around the world. I've not been to uh, Ukraine recently, but um, 
I have been visiting all these Eastern European countries, and particularly very poor developing countries. And then they try to do, but they do not have capacity, they do not have resources. This is what uh, global powers like the United States and European Union, now Koreans, they should do much, much more, provide what is known as uh, official development assistance. Now, U.S. has been the biggest donor country, but they have a limitation. You cannot expect the United States can do all, European Union. And now, as um, one of the fast developing co developed country like uh, Korea, I think they should do much more. So maybe since you, there are many Korean students here, you may speak out to uh, Korean political leaders that please do much, much more uh, what, than what you are doing. Uh, this is what uh, I expect uh, this uh, new, new government should really broaden, broaden their visions beside, beyond the Korean, Korean territory. Uh, because the questions are almost similar, maybe some other question, just one more question. One more yeah, question. Yeah. <laughs> Any burning question, just watch to the mic. <laughs> I'm Lindsay Chung. I'm a senior studying political science you here. Close up to the mic. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I was just wondering, like, you said that it's very important to be a global leader. So I was wondering, what can we do after graduation? I know it's a similar question, but what can we do after graduation to um, really cultivate our leadership, like, particularly like, after our Stanford education? I think your s question is almost a similar. <laughs> Maybe different, right? <laughs> Hi, I'm Tyler Ho. I'm a Fosh at Denver yeah, University. You can speak to the microphone without. Yes. And uh, my question was what are the developed countries' obligations to these de developing countries? And at what point is it too much? Or, like, what are the restrictions that we should hold our countries? up to. Now, the, the United Nations has uh, a very good program and the visions already announced uh, during my time. Uh, I am proud to have uh, prioritized uh, to uh, declare and present to the world the Sustainable Development Goals and also Paris Climate Change Agreement. Uh, I think uh, during this uh, over 70 years of history of the United Nations, I think these uh, sustainable development goals are by far the most ambitious, uh, most practical, and most uh, future-oriented uh, visions. That includes Paris Climate Change Agreement. Uh, the badge I'm wearing all the times uh, represent all 17 uh, visions, 17 goals. Now, we have uh, more than 200 countries, the same from one country to another country. Depending upon where you live, the conditions may be very different, and economic power may be very different. There are OECD countries, about 30 OECD countries, they are well-to-do countries, including United States, European Union, South Korea, Japan, etc., etc. Uh, but the world is not only for them. There are so many people, so many people around the world, 8 billion people. They should be able to live peacefully without any shortage of their needs. The vision of the United Nations is that by 2030, there should be no one who should suffer from abject poverty. Abject poverty. I'm not talking about from this country and other countries. But 
I don't know whether it will be possible to do that because of all this unexpected uh, crisis happening now. Then by 2030, there should be no one who should die from preventable diseases. There are still some diseases whose reason has not been identified by medicine science. But at least from preventable diseases, one should not die. Not a single person should die from this one in 21st century. Then when it comes to education, there should be nobody who should be left out of school, at least the middle, middle school, at least the middle school. These are quite the ambitious vision, but as far as of today, I'm afraid that this may not be able to be achieved. But you should think that you are very lucky persons. You are very lucky person. But you should not take it for granted. The privileges, privileges and opportunities you are enjoying should not be taken for granted. You should appreciate it, and you should do much more for other people, other countries. So there should be some uh, much, much a bigger, bigger size of uh, support for developing countries, developing countries. This is the moral and political duty for OECD countries. And I really count on the United States to, re to really lead and show much, much greater global leadership, not only on hard power, but on soft power too. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Okay. Uh Thanks, uh, Secretary General, for such a moving speech and insightful uh, advice.